Platteville to order on Tuesday, July 10th, 2012. Uh, we'll begin with roll call. Patrice Dino? Here. Steve Becker? Here. Barbara Doss? Here. Eileen Nichols? Here. Dick Bonin? Here. Ken Killian? Here. And Michael Vilecki? Here. Um, first on the agenda tonight, we have a special presentation regarding our 2011 audited financial statements from Johnson Block and Company. So we have about a 10 minute presentation of where we sit as a city. Al, if you would come forward, please. Okay, what an exciting way to start out your meeting tonight, huh? Um, with that being said, I do appreciate being higher up on your agenda. Um, allows me to get here and present this and, and take off again. Um, so I'm just gonna try to summarize in less than 10 minutes the financial condition of the city as of de December 31st, 2011. And any major changes in its operations for the year then ended. Uh, with that being said, I'm not gonna try to go through the audit report page by page, so I will just uh, lead into generalizations about the report itself. Uh, we've given an unqualified opinion on the financial statements meaning that they are fairly presented in all material respects in accordance with U.S. generally accepted accounting principles. Um, uh, that is the highest form of opinion um, you can get on your financial statements from an auditor. As you look at our opinion, you'll also note that we mentioned GASB statement number 54 was implemented in 2011. Uh, you'll notice in the equity section of the Exhibit A3 on the governmental funds that it now refers to non-spendable, restricted, assigned, and unassigned fund balances. Uh, non-spendable will re refer to items such as prepaid items um, where you've uh, obviously put out the money for, uh, whether it be prepaid insurance, something of that type. Um, we don't have it to spend, but it is an asset uh, that will show up as an expenditure in the following year. Restricted, and examples of that would be restricted by, um, by terms of grant agreements, uh, restricted by a donor, that type of restriction where you have to spend it for what it was, in, it was intended for. The assigned fund balance would be assigned by the city council for specific purposes in the subsequent year. Um, all those are listed in detail in the notes to the financial statements. Uh, we also state in the, the notes your fund balance policy. Um, uh, and you, later on, I'll compare where your unassigned fund balance is in relation to your policy. <coughs> we'll focus more on the fund statements, which are exhibits A3 through A9. It includes all governmental funds and the proprietary fund being the water and sewer utility. Uh, these statements are reflected using the same basis of accounting as you use in your budget process. Government-wide statements are exhibits A1 through A2. Those particular statements combine the fund statements into one number um, and also use a different basis of accounting on the governmental funds, that being the full accrual basis of accounting. As far as the governmental fund statements, the total assets of the governmental funds increased to 1.05 million from 2010 to 2011. Of this, $620,000 was an increase in the due from other governments. <coughs> Most of that representing three larger amounts that were still not received on grant requests. One was $175,000 due from the EDA for a stormwater retention pro pond project. Another was $623,000 due from the State Department of Transportation for a highway project. And I believe a great portion of that was to reimburse the city for some 
land purchase purchases connected with that project. $134,000 was for a, uh, actually a 2010 project on Mineral Street. Um, we did note in our report on internal control that we felt the city should review its procedures as far as um, requesting grant reimbursements and that these items were still outstanding when we were here for field work, which was uh, the middle of May. Normally, most grants uh, at least allow you to file quarterly claims. Um, so we felt you need to look at that. Uh, these seem to be outstanding for too long a period of time. Total liabilities of governmental funds increased 4%. Very little change in that, in that area. Total governmental fund balances increased $617,000 to $5.8 million. Significant increases where revenue exceeded expenditures were found in the general fund, $388,000 increase. Capital Projects Fund, which had a $315,000 increase. And TIF number eight, which had a $361,000 increase. <coughs> Significant decreases where expenditures exceeded revenues were in TIF number five um, at a negative $247,000. TIF number six, negative $284,000. And TIF number seven, $229,000. Your unassigned general fund balance of two million nine hundred fifty-four thousand eight ninety-six, represented thirty-nine point nine percent of your general fund expenditures for two thousand eleven. Your policy, as I mentioned, that we disclosed, is to maintain a minimum level of twenty percent. So while that appears to be well over your minimum fund balance policy, um, I would also note that your shared revenue for two thousand eleven was approximately 2.7 million, of which 2.1 was not received until November. So it seems like there's a um, significant reason to have a fund balance uh, that is much higher than the 20% recommended in your fund balance policy. The statement of activities for the governmental funds. Total governmental revenue increased 13%. Approximately half of this increase was attributed to an increase in intergovernmental revenue. Much of that related to the stormwater and the street grants that I mentioned previously. Total governmental fund expenditures increased 5%. Most of that in the capital outlay function. In 2010, the police building was constructed for approximately $3 million. That was offset somewhat by the related increase in street construction projects of about 1.8 million in 2011. I did a review the city of Platteville's expenditures in comparison to nine other, 19 other similar cities in the functions of general government, police, <coughs> fire and ambulance and street maintenance and found the city was about around the average for all 20 cities. As far as the utility operations, water operating income increased to $943,000 and reflects the new water rates that were implemented in 2011. <clears throat> the sewer operating income Decreased 44% to $102,000. And I would suspect this would improve with the uh, new sewer rates that have been implemented in 2012. General obligation debt overall increased the net of 2.7 million to 17.6 million at December 31st, 2011. That represented about 63% of your total debt limit. 
Mortgage revenue bonds, which are backed by the revenues of the utility, increased the net of $3.8 million. Overall, the city ended the year in good financial position. Governmental fund balances increased 11.8%. And it appears the general fund balance is providing an adequate cash flow, along with some flexibility should there be cuts to outside sources of revenue, such as state shared revenue. Water operations have improved substantially with the rate increase and the sewer operation should improve in 2012 with the rate increase going into effect. City, the city still has $10.3 million of general obligation debt capacity at December 31st, 2011. Any questions that I could answer at this point? I have one. Are, are we significantly above the average with regard to the proportion of our budget that comes from intergovernmental uh, payments such as state shared revenue? Your state share revenue is almost uh, double the average of other cities of your size. So we're more vulnerable should the state decide to balance its budget by cutting shared revenues than other cities our size or with similar conditions would be. Correct. Hence the reason to have a, a higher fund balance than the 20% that your, your policy alludes to. Any other questions? Again, I'm available anytime. Uh, I guess if you work through Dwayne, um, I'll try to answer your questions whenever you may have those. So, again, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you letting us be of service to you. Uh, if there are no other questions. We seem to be in okay shape. Seem to be in good financial condition. Okay, that's yep. probably the one thing we want to know more than anything else. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is consideration of the consent uh -huh. calendar. The following items may be approved on a single motion and vote due to their routine nature and or previous discussion. Please indicate if you'd prefer separate discussion and action. Item A is the minutes of the June 26, 2012 council meeting. B is payment of bills, C, the June financial report, D is appointments to boards and commissions. commissions. Tonight, I'm appointing to the plan commission, Karen Rahulia, to the commission on aging, Josephine Kisher, and to the museum board, Tracy Roberts. Item E is licenses for one and or two year operators for premises is licensed to traffic in fermented malt beverages and intoxicating liquors as indicated in your packet. Item F is permits, a street closing on July 18th for a block party on Division Street from Chestnut to Irene. Item two is a parade, September 8th, Chamber of Commerce has asked for the Dairy Days Parade at 9.30 a.m. on Main Street from Hickory to Broadway. And item three, a parade on October 20th for UW Platteville for the homecoming parade at 10 a.m. on Main Street from Hickory to Virgin. Is there any item on which you'd prefer separate discussion and action? Just a clarification on number one, is that supposed to be Bradford? To go look in division, on. division Street, block party. To Bradford, not Irene. It is Bradford. Bradford to Irene. It's wrong. Bradford. Bradford. Okay. Can we assume that's a typo? I believe it is. Okay. With that correction, is there any item that you prefer? Move to adopt the consent agenda as published. Second. Consent calendar. The motion is second. All in favor, say aye. All right. Aye. Aye. Both same sign. Motion carries. Item five tonight is citizens' comments, observations, observations, and petitions. If any, uh, we ask that you please limit your comments to no more than five minutes. Dorothy Genthy, if you would come forward, please. State your name and local address. And Hello, my name is Dorothy Genthe. I live at 160 Jewett Street in Platteville. I'd like to uh, address uh, the item uh, that will be discussed at your work session, the City Dispatch Services. Um, I don't know how many of you ever used 911 
most of you look like you're pretty healthy and um, for maybe not of the age where you would need to use it. I'd like you to consider the things about keeping the dispatchers. Number one, safety to public as well as safety to police officers in the city of Platteville. Uh, two, delays through county can't be helped because county has a call list with ranking order of emergencies. County calls are served according to degree of emergency. The county will issue a hold all radio traffic for a major incident, which could mean a great delay if someone would fall and uh, probably uh, break a leg or something, but still weren't critical. Costs, unemployment of police dispatchers means severance pay by past practices, all benefits and fringes plus unemployment costs plus job loss for Platteville. The county will have a need for more personnel and incur, incur more costs for taxpayers at the county level. Response time to emergencies determines your insurance rating for homeowners as well as businesses in the city. Lower rating, higher costs. This includes fire and EMT as well as police. This is a citywide issue as well as a township issue because they are in our fire district. Delay in response could result in lawsuits. Officers responsible for more paperwork causing more office time and less street time plus overtime. Each officer will need computers to develop individual reports instead of dispatcher reporting for state and federal or I should say state and county reports. Some statistics from the year-end reports uh, for the city of Platteville. In uh, 2011, there were 610 9-11 calls. There were 46,000 phone calls to the dispatcher, which were not 9-11 calls, but which would be uh, concerned, considered by some people to be very important. Uh, also, that includes people from uh, visitors to our commu community. 130,054 radio transmission calls to officers. We have a combined dispatch experience of 130 years in our Platteville Police Department. They have saved lives, babies, prevented suicides, uh, also taped things that uh, Items like, for instance, the car bomb and the, um, um, I believe there were some rifles or some guns in a certain uh, vehicle. Um, and 9-11 calls, uh, the dispatcher activity, 9-11 calls, and which had 610 also all other uh, hour after hours calls. Uh, radio transmissions, I mentioned how many of those were. I answer after hours buzzer at the police department, which sometimes are emergencies for citizens and strangers in uh, crisis, uh, somebody having a wild party or, or going through uh, a neighborhood and causing some vandalism. Uh, they also entered in uh, 2011 300 plus warrants for the state and county courts. They do the crime reports for um, state and county agencies. Warrants must be validated every few months. Last uh, at uh, one of these weeks when I had this in the paper, there were 800 parking notices. Uh, just think how many more you're going to get when you have uh, parking by permit only and someone decides they're not going to obey that. Uh, as I mentioned before, the gun and bomb incident was on tape because the dispatcher was there to de dedicate that camera so a record of activity could be obtained. This record will be used for evidence in the upcoming trial. The Platteville defeat Police Department is a backup for the Grant County Sheriff Department, and the Grant County Sheriff Department is a Platteville Police D Department backup. Without a backup, the de in department uh, for se severe weather, without a backup department, uh, severe weather could wipe out the dispatch facilities, and the county could be without police communications affecting the entire county. S for instance, a tornado, if it took out the tower or for the Sheriff's Department. Senior citizens need reassurance that someone will help them. 
the sooner the better. The population of seniors is growing in Platteville. They're coming from all over the area and even from out of state because of the services that are available here. They're expecting a certain level of service for their activity and for their safety. At UWP, an additional 1,000 th students is being recruited this year. This means more incidents, which calls for more services, more parking tickets. Parents sending their students to school want not only education and infrastructure, but also security, safety, and quality of life. If there is not safety or security, they may not send their students here. Now is not the time to offer less for our citizens as well as the incoming students. We need a good impression of our city. Grant County has qualified personnel, but the call volume will be overwhelming. The county is only required to take 911 calls, so where do the other 46,000 calls go? Severity of calls may not be clear clearly indicated to the county dispatchers. Persons calling may be in shock or unable to give clear instructions as to needs, locations, or leaving the dispatcher to guess about the situation. Local dispatchers know their public, streets, dwellings, where people work, and often what family member to call. This would not happen at the county level. Every citizen has a right to feel safe, have calls answered promptly, not on as an available basis. Uh, I'd like to tell you about my experience this last January. Putting out salt so that I would not fall, I did fall on the only spot that I didn't cover. I called on my cell phone. I will try to find someone for you. Not the right thing to do. It's not the dispatcher's fault. You probably had a whole list of things or calls that you had to deal with. Usually you get service within five minutes in this city, something that you should be proud of, which goes back to response time. I called again after better than five minutes and got no response. Got the same thing, wanting to know if I'd hit my head or if I'd broken anything. I don't know, I hurt, I was out on the cement and uh, it was cold and I'm glad that it was a mild winter. It was almost half hour before I got any help. I don't think people in this community want that situation. I certainly don't want it again. Thank you. Michael Mayo, you state your name and local address. Michael Mayo, 375 South Chestnut Street. Dorothy was, you know, very, uh, with all the information she gave us, was, was fantastic. The statistics, statistics, the numbers, which are very impressive. Our police department works hard. We could see by just the calls that we hear in the middle of the night. Where do we go? Where do any of uh, the citizens go without a dispatcher? We get thrown into the Grant County program and if there is an emergency, does that Grant County individual know where that street is located? Can that Grant County dispatcher tell that, so tell that person directly on how to get to that location? No. Our dispatchers do. Our dispatchers know the city. They live in the city. They are a major part of the city. And without those services, the city will be in really bad shape. I mean, look at this. We're a city that's growing. We have all these new students coming in. They don't know where they're going, so they're gonna wind up at the police headquarters. Get information to find out what's going on, if anything. Nobody's gonna be there. Patrolmen are on the road. You've got calls that have to be contained by the, the police department or, who may even be sent to the wrong address because the Grant County person may not understand the enunciation of that individual. Our people do. Our people know where the town, where the, these in, 
things are in the town. Our people are confident and they know what they're doing. To throw or to, to remove the dispatch service would be akin to <coughs> be being abusive to the rest of the city. We're, we're told we're a friendly community. I don't want to go into that because we have enough problems with regards to parking. And every street we have has limited parking or restricted parking. I really wouldn't want to be, have a party and tell my people that, well, you can't park here and you can't park there, but this is a friendly town. But we have dispatchers that know every nook and cranny in this city, every way to go around any obstructions. Grant County people don't. And it's incumbent upon you the city council to keep them and to make sure that not only the citizens are protected, but the citizens can rest assured that there is somebody there to help them. Thank you. Moving on tonight to reports, committee reports, uh, plan commission. I have nothing to add. Tourism Committee, nothing to add. Library Board, nothing to add. Museum, nothing. <clears throat> Commission on Aging. The packet also is other reports, the June Airport Financial Report, the June Water and Sewer Expenditures and Revenues Report, and Department Progress Reports. Any questions or comments on those? I was reading through the uh, road work in town and it seems to be moving along pretty well and I think, uh, what did I see, two or three weeks and we expect Washington to be done? Uh, maybe a little bit more, but it's it should come in a little bit early, yeah. It should come in early. Have, have the electrical issues been resolved on 2nd Street? It seems like that project is not moving very fast. The, uh, the electrical issues are, are finishing up. Uh, by the end of next week, uh, Alliant and CenturyLink should have all of their lines underground and services switched over that need to be done. So here in a couple of weeks, our contractors should be able to come back uh, and finish up the work on the street itself. Is it still on schedule to be done before the 1st of September? Yes. Cool. Anything else? Thank you. Item seven tonight is action items. Item A under action is resolution 12-20, <coughs> authorizing the submission of a Wisconsin Department of Transportation Facilities for Economic Assistance, or otherwise known as a T grant application. Uh, do we have any staff comment on that? Uh, city Council uh, reviewed this at our last meeting. Um, the city of Platteville has applied for a uh, transportation uh, facilities for economic assistance grant. And uh, this is a, a step that we need to have the city council approve this resolution um, to ensure that we're able to receive that grant. Uh, there's no monetary figures in this resolution. That's correct. The only thing that it says is that the city agrees to commit at least 50% of the cost of construction, yet there's not even a hint of what the cost of construction might be or where we might find whatever that 50% is. That makes me kind of more than a little uncomfortable. Uh, that's correct. Uh, most uh, grants do require a match. Uh, this one, the match is 50%. Um, we have had preliminary talks with uh, the state of Wisconsin uh, Department of Transportation, and uh, we're under the impression that the grant amount will be close to around $300,000. So a 50% match would be an, around $300,000 from the city or a TIF district or another entity wherever the construction should occur. Um, originally, the project in our industrial park was planned much larger than this. However, with the um, CDBG grant that was not filled or um, um, it was filed but was not awarded, um, we're gonna have to cut that project back substantially 
And so we're anticipating doing, if the, if the council is willing to accept this, uh, probably around a $600,000 project in the industrial park using $300,000 from the state to match ours. And we don't know where that 300000 that is ours will come for. It could be TIF. It could, right. it could be Stonebridge Road. It could be whatever the city council wants. Uh, we will be discussing the road projects later this evening. But, um, I mean, it, there's no obligation to, to accept the grant. But I, I think that we'd probably want to take a look at it and discuss it. Worst that can happen is we don't use it. Or give it back, yeah. Never looks good if you apply for a grant and then give it back. I think the issue here is if you do that and you give it back, then probably the next time you apply, you won't be looked on very favorably. So I think we have to be pre prepared for the eventuality that if this is passed, that means we need to be able to allocate $300,000 if that's what is required. So has city staff considered where this money will come from? Well, I'm anticipating that it'll come out of our capital improvement projects budget, um, which we haven't year. discussed. Uh, it would be next year, 2013. This was for Vision, right? Um, originally, it was for Vision Drive. Uh, that project is well over a million dollars to do, so we're going to have to cut it back substantially. And, and I don't recall exactly what we're going to be proposing, um, but I believe it's more of an improvement to Evergreen at this point. We have to keep the cost much lower than what Vision Drive was going to cost us. Don't we need to know a lot more than what we've got right here in front of us? As far as monies? And so you're, you're, the, the resolution before you is to, um, to express your interest in applying for the grant and to get the money. Um, if you're not comfortable doing that, we could table it and review this um, and talk a little bit more about street projects this evening. Is there money in the TIF? Uh, that TIF district, uh, as well as a couple of others, are not um, in the best financial shape. Um, at this point, I, I don't believe that it's going to close in the black. So we need to work on that and encourage additional development within TID 6. If you recall, TID 6 is all, the uh, majority of it is farmer's fields. It's, it's a vast open area, so there, there isn't a lot of development there to support the TID. Could it borrow from another TID? There are some options, and that certainly is one of them. I would but, move to table this until our next meeting, and I would like to have more information. I, more information on what project we are thinking about doing and how it could be paid for. I agree that if you apply for a grant on a, are awarded a grant, you probably don't want to turn it back to the state. So rather than saying, you know, $300,000 without knowing what our capital improvement budget is, we haven't even discussed that yet, and without knowing exactly what project is being proposed, uh, I would prefer to table it. Second. So you made a motion to table? Yes, I made the motion to okay. table. And then and Dick, Dick seconded. seconded. Not the debatable. We'll have a roll call vote, please, on tabling it. Steiner? Nope. 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 It's not debatable. Yes. I would just ask the date. Is there a deadline for submitting the grant? Keep going with roll call. Decker? Please. Nope. Goss? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Galecki? No. Motion carries. Now we reverse the decision we just made. What's your question? Is there a deadline or a date on associated with this before we table? We ought to ask if there's any timeline we ought to be looking at. Is there a time? Is there a time you just uh, table deadline? It. We, we met with the DOT about a month ago because this is the second agenda it's been on, and at that time they were prepared to issue us a grant. I suspect the longer we wait, the more applications they'll get from other people. But um, Howard, do you know any specific? deadline I, I don't know of a specific one uh, I do not have one either at this time um, perhaps if 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 I were to advise prior to the motion I would suggest maybe tabling it to later in the agenda after we've talked about the street projects maybe that would be a good time to consider this 
Well, since we're not going to have a meeting now for almost a month, the table and the effects puts it off for at least a month. Right. The way it's sitting right now. And, and I think we should be looking at doing this anyway. I don't think that we're in a position to be turned down free money. I look at it. But, uh, I mean, people need to understand that Robert's rules say once you have motions to the table, you can't discuss it, you vote on it. And, and that's why we did it. But there's nothing stopping us from voting to take it off the table now and doing it differently. So that's why I proceeded as I did. So Ken still could ask the question and he still could have the information he wanted. Didn't so can it be foreclose. taken off the table at the work session? I don't see why not. Okay. Brian, can you see any reason why not? It's <clears throat> there's no um, item on the agenda after the work session. I guess you could uh, take it off the table before you adjourn. Sure. Okay. Let's consider that as a possibility then. Anything else on that? Item B tonight under action items is resolution 12-21, borrowing resolution in the amount of $175,000 for the Avalon Theater on behalf of the RDA. Do we have any staff? Commentary on that? Uh, yeah, just a little background. The State Theaters owns the Millennium and the Avalon Theaters. They need to upgrade their projection and sound equipment to go digital. Uh, the industry is going all digital for their movies. And then basically, if they want to stay in business, they need to make that uh, transition. Uh, the Millennium, due to the number of screens that they have, uh, is able to tap into some. Uh, loaning money from the industry itself, but the Avalon does not qualify. Uh, so they've made an application to the RDA for some financial assistance to that. It basically, it costs $75,000 per screen approximately, so it costs for the Avalon about $225,000 to make this uh, conversion. Uh, the RDA uh, considered this request. Uh, that is more money than they have available of their own funds, and they also wanted the applicant to have some additional equity into it so they their recommendation is to approve a, a loan of 175,000 uh, for a seven-year term they would prefer the RDA would prefer that the city borrow the money because we can borrow it at a lower rate than the RDA can uh, that would basically be a pass-through loan to the uh, state theaters um, to allow that conversion um, basically as it is it, the, the RDA is looking at it, it's a an important business in the downtown area. We'd hate to have that closed down uh, and have an empty building to deal with. So they would prefer to provide some assistance uh, to them. So their request is to have the, the city borrow the $175,000. Uh, Mount City Bank was the lowest uh, proposal at 1.9% with the seven year term. Uh, and then that would be loan to state theaters for that conversion. Are there any questions? Will this affect our our borrowing percentage? It would go against the city's borrowing since the city would actually be doing the borrowing under this request. And a related question to that, the next uh, item on the agenda also requests uh, borrowing. Is that, a, that's 292,000. Is the existing loan already counted against our borrowing capacity? Yes. yes. So if we roll it over, that won't do anything to our borrowing capacity. All right, that, that's an extension to what we had already borrowed. Ken, you had some. I have a couple of questions. Um, continuation from last time, um, what is the collateral as far as uh, this particular uh, loan? Uh, Let's say that they don't uh, meet their payments, so, so the bank wants their money, so who's going to be responsible? The, uh, we'll have the, the equipment itself, the value of the equipment, and then a personal guarantee. Well, that, the, I wondered about what is the personal guarantee? I mean, how good is a personal guarantee? I believe a personal guarantee is a guarantee against the individual's assets, assets not the business's right. assets. Is right. that going to be listing the assets of the person? Like if I went to borrow for a house, to make another, to build another house, would my house be collateral? Would, we, would that be my asset? Is this what's going to happen here? Whatever assets the, the individual has available um, to tap into, I, I don't know exactly what that amounts to for Mr. DeYoung. 
homes would typically be collateralized elsewhere on other issues. It wouldn't typically be part of the personal guarantee. Is the building held free and clear by them, or is there a mortgage on the building? There is a mortgage on the building. We don't know what percent of its value that mortgage is. I think we did, but I didn't bring those papers along. Uh, the, the gentleman, Mr. DeYoung, shared his complete financial picture in closed session with the RDA, and it was after a complete review of those statements that the RDA made this decision and asks the City Council to uh, borrow this money so that we can pass it through to him. I think that uh, there were, uh, th those statements were scrutinized in closed session, which is kind of where you would look at someone's personal financial statements. So the RDA felt there was sufficient collateral and security against That's the correct. Thing. And the bank does too. Well, the, bank, the bank's got the city to pay it back. So I'm sure they were comfortable with this. Any other questions? Mr. Mayo would like to hold the uh, forth on this. Would you please come forward, state your name and local address. Michael Mayo, 375 South Chestnut Street here in Platteville. As a candidate for council, I had been talking to some of my constituents about this particular program. And lo and behold, I found out that there was a fund that was set up with donations by the people in the city of Platteville to save the theater. The money was then loaned to the theater so that they could continue to operate. Money was paid back with interest. Where is that money now? And is this $175,000, is that an addition to the money that was loaned and is still available for the theater? Where is that? Where is the funds that they that were accumulated? Just a little history here. Back in the 90s, that building was a single screen theater. And as movie habits changed and so on, they felt they needed to go to a, uh, a multi-screen theater. And at the time, uh, they were able to secure financing for all but about 100,000 of the needed renovations to take the older facility and turn it into what we have today, leaving a fairly sizable uh, theater for major movies and the smaller ones for, for other ones. Uh, that money was raised by a group called Building Platteville Incorporated. In fact, I was fairly heavily involved in that group, and the idea was that we would raise that money, uh, loan it to the theater project, which was at the time the Blay Bombs, and that's, by the way, all been paid back since then. Uh, and then they would pay it back, I think, over 10 years was the uh, the time period and that money then would go into a revolving fund that could be used to support other projects in the community and so uh, there still is a building Platteville uh, and so far as I know there still is money there but that's unrelated to the current owners of the theater that money was paid back and no longer is part of what if they have that money on. was paid back as you say that money should still be available correct Michael the building Platteville was not solely directed that the first project of building Platteville was the theater. But there have been subsequent projects, including the Veterans Memorial. I, I, I understand even, that. But so I think that the other money has been loaned. Dorothy, are you on the board? Oh, God. Oh, Dorothy Genthe. The money has been loaned and reloaned and reloaned again, and at the present time there may be fifteen thousand dollars, and maybe not that many. But uh, we have had most uh, pretty successful loans, but no sooner are they paid than they're loaned out again. So we do not have 
much more than maybe 10, 15,000 at this time. In building Platteville is a separate entity from the city. Pardon? In building Platteville is a separate entity from the city. Yes, it's private, definitely. It's a private, it's a private uh, type of thing. Uh, 501C3, I believe it's called. And uh, if we had it, we certainly would, would loan it to him, but we don't have that. Thank you. So no one knows right now where any of the funds are. What, what the, what's well, left? Right? It's, it's not a. Out I understand that. But yeah. it's not a city. And it's not a city out. department, now, Mike. When, when you get uh, fifteen thousand, say among six or seven uh, different entities. Uh, it, excuse me. Excuse right, me. We discussed that later. Back, we yeah. we need. That that money is a private foundation. The city has no claim on it. And so where it is, we would not necessarily know because it isn't our money and we don't have anything to do with it. Just like any this, other private foundation. You know, know, how much more can the city borrow or uh, is the city of Platteville now becoming a bank? I mean, you know, yes, you've got a great interest rate at 1.9%, but I don't think there's mutual savings and loan next to the city of Platteville. And when you take approximately $400,000 out of your borrowing budget, that's a considerable amount of money. And who's going to pay for it when all is said and done? If the city council will sign an affidavit stating that they will be responsible if there's any default by the entities that they're going to loan this money to, then I say fine, do it. But if you're not going to take the responsibility, why should we, the residents and taxpayers of this town, take that responsibility? Thank you. I make a motion we approve the request to provide a loan to the Avalon to assist with the equipment upgrades. I second it. The motion is second. Is there any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Steiner? Yes. Becker? Yes. Doss? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? No. Zalecki? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Item C under action tonight is resolution 12-22, a borrowing resolution to extend the loan of $292,757.57 for the Bailey Building on behalf of the RDA. Any staff commentary? Yeah, as I mentioned before, the, there's already a loan that's been provided uh, through the city and the RDA uh, that was taken out uh, to assist with the renovations of that building. Uh, they have a balloon payment coming up in August of this year. Uh, they're trying to get some additional equity built in that pro project so they can do some uh, long-term financing through conventional means. Uh, so they're essentially requesting a three-year extension to that payment. Uh, we are able to get uh, a loan at this point at a, at a much better rate than the, uh, the current loan. Uh, we were at 5.16%. We've got a proposal at 3.3%. And so the request would be to take that loan out in that amount for a, a three-year uh, loan for Bailey Group LLC. Are there any questions? And this is not adding to the debt load. This is actually just extending. Right. The, the original loan was for 320000 uh, Now they're down to the 290 some thousand. So <laughs> extending what they owe uh, an additional three years. When was this work going to be done? The work is already done. Um, if you recall, the, the the upper floor of that building was vacant and the roof was leaking and the windows were falling apart. So they converted that to eight uh, apartments and made the exterior repairs to the building and some utility improvements as well. So that work is all done. It's basically just extending the, the <coughs> financing. Okay. And at this point, all the units are full, so it's been a successful project from that standpoint. Move to approve. Second. The motion is second. Any discussion? Yeah, I have a couple questions before we vote on this one. The, the loan has been reduced uh, about $27,000 over the last five years. Has the payment schedule that was originally set up with the original note been met? Yes. Okay. Uh, the rate that we have here from American Bank, which is the current hold, 
mortgage holder is 3.3. Um, did we ask for a bid from other banks? In the previous item we just looked at, American Bank had a rate of uh, 2.7, and we ended up going with Mountain City Bank for 1.9. Did we ask for uh, bids from other banks? Or did we just automatically ask to roll this over? If we didn't ask for other banks, I think we ought to be shopping around. This is 3.3 versus 1.9. It's a sizable difference. Dwayne, is that something you can comment on? Well, the original bid, the original one was uh, loaned out, uh, or has, was bid out, but uh, this last time I was asked just to uh, uh, find out what the rate would be for an extension, so it was not bid out this last time. I think we should bid it out. Before we approve it. I mean, I don't know why I'm, you wouldn't. I'm, I'm concerned about one thing here. It had to be known at the time that when this balloon payment came forward, they were going to need equity and so on to do this. I'm a little concerned why that didn't happen. Uh, I think part of the reason it didn't happen, if you want to look, does their original loan was made in 2007. And you might recall that in 2008, we had a disaster strike in real estate markets. And even though the, the improvements have been made and the apartments rented, and I think people would say that... Uh, uh, it was a good renovation. I mean, I've been in some of those apartments. They're very nicely done. It just isn't assessing out at the rate it it was projected to assess to, if is you can imagine. I mean, has there been in other words, you know, the, the idea was that after those eight apartments were done, the assessed value would have risen to a certain amount. But now, with the way real estate... Uh, has declined that it, it didn't assess at the level that it was projected to assess at in 2007. If that, I uh, did I, yeah. did so I say are, that right? So are you saying that that the amount of the note is more than uh, than the fair market value of the building we're oh, talking no, about? Oh, no, no. Well, I'd, do we have any information on that? I would think we that. Had, did, I, I think I, we should see that. Again, I didn't, we didn't, I mean, the RDA probably had it. I don't know if you have that. I don't have it with to, with me this evening. I, I, I don't have what the assessed. Well, we, okay. Larry, do you? Well, I do saying, not, but I think what you're looking for is an appraisal. I, what I'm saying is we didn't shop around for a note. We're looking for a note extension. We didn't shop it around, apparently, and we don't know the difference between the, the relationship between the value of the note and the fair market value of the building. I would think before we vote on this, we ought to have that information. At least I'd like to have it. I'd like to know it. I don't know if delaying uh, to the next meeting is going to put us past the deadline of some import. Well, I think that the balloon payment is due when, Joe? August 1. August 1. It can always be extended two weeks. That's not a big deal. Or whatever. I mean, I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I agree with you, Steve. I'd like to know those things, too. I think it's just prudent to know that. Anything else? I think we have a motion. I think we do. And a second. We'll call vote, please. Steiner? Yes. Becker? Nope. Goss? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Bonin? Nope. Gillian? No. Delecky? No. Motion fails. I think we'd like to know that stuff. Anything else related to that? Okay, moving on to information and discussion items tonight. Item A is a resolution terminating TIF District Number 3 and authorizing the City Treasurer to distribute excess increment to the overlying tax districts. Staff comment? This is a, a rather routine um, resolution that is approved when the TIF districts are completed. Uh, this particular TIF district, when it's closed, will add uh, slightly over $10 million to, um, to the value of our, of our uh, tax base. And um, uh, at this time, it is not anticipated that there will be excess increment uh, to be distributed to other jurisdictions. Um, so it, it's simply the format of the resolution. Will there be, um, will the TIF be in the black? Yes. Or will there be 
penalties to assess? It will be in the black and it is paying off earlier than, than necessary. Because so that's it, the other alternative, right? When a TIF closes out, other entities can be. Well, if it's in the red, then it's the city's responsibility to cover the difference. Yep. But in this one, it is a, a successful TIF. Um, the city did a lot of foresight when it put this into place and um, it's adding a significant tax base to your community. And this is the initial phase of the industry park. So this was opened in approximately the fall of 1987. That's what it says here. <coughs> so. Some of us remember that ribbon cutting. 25 years. Any other questions or comments on that? Item B tonight is an ordinance amending parking permit regulations. Any staff comment? Um, You'll see that the staff note has been updated. Uh, I did add number three um, regarding Sunset Drive. I guess before I make changes, I'd like some specific direction from the council as to what changes you would like made. Um, but other than that, it should still be the same documentation you received at our last meeting. Um, last night, the RDA went on record and, and uh, we don't have the minutes typed up yet but asking that uh, the uh, one block area from Pine Street on Roundtree to Mitchell a Avenue and the one block area on Bailey to Mitchell Avenue be removed from this parking zone. So this would be, this would include the uh, perpendicular lot on Roundtree that's up behind McGregor Plaza. It would be that one block to Mitchell and then on Bailey uh, from basically Mount City Bank and uh, uh, Bell Real Estate, just one block. And to have that removed from this parking ordinance. We have other issues we wanna talk about with that, but the first would be that it's not covered by this ordinance. And the second thing I would say is as the council person that represents Sunset Drive and with looking at the results of Sunset Drive, it appeared that a great majority, more than a majority, a significant majority of Sunset Drive uh, per favored permit parking. So I would uh, favor permit parking in that area. I'd like to see those changes made too. Anybody else has any feelings? I about have that? some comments about that. So the RDA has uh, recommended that part of Bailey to Mitchell uh, be included. Um, so I'm looking at that, and that's the area I said last time that uh, people have uh, complained about as far as the parking. Now I've given out tonight a um, proposal, and uh, Barb, you said that per perpendicular parking will be recommended by RDA, is that correct? Uh, in a subsequent the, um, meeting, we would expect for the, R the RDA to come back and talk about uh, what we might call residential or overnight parking in city-owned properties, that being one, and having that be permitted and likely leased parking. So, but at this point, we just, first of all, it has to be taken out of this parking zone for that. So that's what, this would take it out of this ordinance, this parking area and this ordinance. So I do not favor um, removing the Bailey from the restricted parking area and making that, I uh, assume you're saying here, some parking for uh, uh, residents from Main Street. I, um, I am in favor of the perpendicular parking between Pine Street and uh, Mitchell Avenue. And um, I looked at that some as far as uh, the improvement of that area, and I would like to go through that just briefly. I measured the other day the distance from the um, uh, bushes there where the, uh, in, the indent starts, and it's 276 feet, which is about 27 stalls. And I propose, propose here a uh, fee of $20 per month, which is $240 per year. 
uh, time 27 spaces is $6,480 per year. And this would be, of course, uh, an area signed differently. Uh, it would be paid permit parking. And then um, neighbors and myself would like to see improvement of the area as far as appearance and uh, put in landscaping in front of the uh, cars, uh, between the cars and the fence and the roof. And I called up a major um, uh, landscaping company and uh, found out that, for example, junipers would cost uh, about $120 for a six foot tree, and that figures out to be about 40 trees along there, which is $4,800. And then there's some shipping costs. I wanted to do, to do this to get some idea as to the feasibility of this particular project. So the landscaping is to hide the ugliness of the roof. There was original landscaping there when that uh, plaza was built many years ago, and that landscaping has uh, uh, died. There's only a small amount left. So the source of the funding I'm proposing here as far as the, the landscaping is from the perpendicular parking. Uh, the last thing I have here is the round tree house uh, they would like to have the sign in front of them uh, removed and moved down to the end of the retaining wall. Uh, and the purpose of this move is so that the uh, pictures don't have to have this big sign uh, in the picture of Roundtree House. So this is what I uh, believe in. I believe that we should not be taking the Bailey part out I'll go along with the uh, area along Round Tree <coughs> perpendicular parking, but I don't believe that the residents of that area should have to be solving the problem for Main Street parking. Main Street should be solving this problem closer to where the residents live, where the employees are. And don't put that problem in the neighborhood. As I said twice before, neighbors have complained about this parking well, I'm not against What's I'm the problem against with it. Bailey's uh, Avenue, Ken? What problem do you have with that? The neighbors? No, not wrong, trees either. What's the your problem? It's, it's neighborhood parking. It's parking in the neighborhood. Ken, um, I, I believe that it would be highly likely that the RDA would come back in terms of Bailey asking that that be no overnight parking. So if your issue is that Bailey... Uh, Avenue would become an overnight parking space for downtown. I believe that that would not be the case. Um, that the over that the leased overnight parking would be only in the perpendicular slots on Roundtree. So, what is your proposal for Bailey? Probably two to four hour parking, so that's that people. That's what it is signed now. That's, isn't it signed? It's signed, isn't it signed to our parking? Well, there's a map in your book. It's orange and it says permit parking or to our parking. It's, right now it's permit parking or to our parking. Uh, we, have, we believe that it's likely that some of the employees from Main Street might park on Bailey. No. And so that would give them the opportunity to park and not be parking on Main Street where other, where Customers would generally park. Well, it's as I said, it's signed already that one block, and then it changes to another type of parking. Other comments on this? Not on that particular. Well, I I make a comment. I like uh, Ken's idea on the round tree. I uh, think, and I think the. Um, the idea of improving the looks of the area with any revenue that would be generated from uh, overnight parking, renting out, that would be a, a nice uh, improvement for that area. I think if they want the looks to change, I think they ought to be responsible for covering those costs instead of expecting the taxpayers to do it. Um, I, 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 would, I would insert that as the RDA has talked about uh, leased parking and leased parking in the downtown area, and the amount of leased parking that the feeling is, I would say, I could say from the RDA, that it would not be 
extravagant to believe that people could pay a dollar a day. So rather than a $20 fee, it would be more likely to be a $30 fee per month. And the RDA, I believe, would say that one of the largest issues that uh, has been affecting parking is enforcement. And so I believe that it would be also fair to say that the RDA will ask about directing the money from any leased parking into parking enforcement um, so that there's regular enforcement. I think that we, when we held our open meeting, we certainly heard that from people, that there were enforcement issues. And um, frankly, I, I wonder what the enforcement plan is for this newly established parking zone because if there isn't regular, consistent, everyday enforcement, then you don't really have a parking plan because enforcement of the law is really, I mean, I, I walk that area and I can tell you this morning that when I walk that area, even though cars that are parked on the street are supposed to having parking permits, half of them did not have a parking permit and I didn't see any tickets. So, I mean, I, I guess I have a question about enforcement, how it's going to be enforced, who's going to be responsible, how many hours a week, how many hours a day. Because if we're count, if the enforcement plan is, if I'm, an, if I'm a citizen in the area and I have to call and say, someone's parking in front of my house and they don't have a tag and they've been here, here more than two hours, I, I really don't think that we're going to... I think you raise a good point. If we if we do find a revenue stream, enforcement of the ordinances is something that you may want to budget for. Right, out of the revenue that's generated. Anything else on this? Um, I just have a, a comment about the, the landlord permit, and I would recommend that each landlord receive two permits. And the reason I would recommend that is because sometimes you have two people, the husband and the wife, coming over to the property working, and the other thing is that if they are having um, plumbing work done or electrical work done or something, and you can let the person use that while they're there working on the property, otherwise that particular person would conceivably get a fine for parking on the street to try to do some repair to the building. So I would say two for a landlord, not one. And I, I think one was what was presented in the ordinance. I um, have another um, little document here I'd like to talk about. And so I'd like to find out uh, about uh, changing the signage on some of these places. Uh, is this related to this ordinance? Yes, it is. Okay. And this is, um, this memo is, in, is, is an email to Al Probst, Al Probst family. And uh, there are two things on here. Uh, one is the signage uh, around the parks. Sherman Park and Harrison Park. Now the signage right now says permit parking or two hour parking, uh, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. And I'm recommending that that signage be changed to permit parking or four hour parking, 6 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. And the Monday through Friday be taken off. Now that, uh, sh that change is partly covered already in the um, document here from the city manager but in in uh, looking at that I, I think there should be an added section to um, the regulations 39.20 and that should be section number four and that added section number four should read as I give in the first paragraph four hour parking from 6 a.m. to 10 30 p.m. or, per, or per permit parking it is not strictly four hour parking as given here in this resolution uh, ordinance number on the back page. So that's one item. And so I assume in the, in the second paragraph then that somebody parking next to the park could park there with a permit for 48 hours. Is that true? How can somebody park for Doug? 
under under which scenario the proposal says four <laughs> hours it doesn't say but, 48 but if, but if somebody has a permit my this is a side question if somebody has a permit can you can you thus park at a spot on the street for 48 hours we don't allow parking in excess of 24 hours so that we chalk for 48 hours permit or otherwise I thought the I thought the number was 48 hours two we days chalk for it yeah what does that mean we go out and chalk the tires to see if the vehicle has been moved and if it's yeah. not moved in the 25th hour you ticket it we go back it's, out and we have 24 hours not 48 it depends on the areas that you're talking about, but for the okay. the zone that you're talking about. Oh, so there is a regulation, yes. either 24 or 48. Yes. Okay. I know about it because I've gotten a ticket. You pay it? I paid it. Good man. Good, good payment. Okay. Uh, the next one is um, the bottom here, the ordinance. Um, um, the Probst family would like more than they'd like more than the four permits and they're not the only family that wants more than the four permits and so I'm not speaking just for the probe family but for another family at least uh, in the same situation so in looking at this paragraph then he's in disagreement with the part that says owner occupied dwelling units may apply for an additional resident parking permit annually for each licensed driver up to a total of two additional permits. And I interpret that to mean that when we put that in there about owner occupied that the concern is about renters. Maybe I didn't interpret that correctly. I think the ordinance uh, would have to be changed to issue a, license, a, a uh, permit to every licensed driver in the family. And I think one, one way to solve this is to use the definition of family from the limited occupancy of residential overlay district, which is in section 220514B. And that uh, there's one definition there, there's three of them actually. The one I'm referring to in, in the case of the Probst family and the other family is that a family shall mean one of the following groups. One, any number of persons, all of whom are related to each other by blood, adoption, marriage, or legal guardianship, along with up to one rumor or border not so related, living together in one dwelling unit as a single housekeeping entity. And there are two other definitions of family. And I won't go through those. So my recommendation is that uh, this portion of the um, ordinance be recreated and this would be uh, part of 39.211 and that the section be reading as follows a dwelling unit may apply annually for an additional resident parking permit for each licensed driver in a family as defined in section 22.0514b my reason for recommendation one the use of this would allow more flexibility True, a few more permits would have to be handed out. I don't think that's a big concern. There won't be that many families. Secondly, the use of the definition of family in 22.0514 would prevent the, prevent the issuing of permits to more than uh, two where three or four unrelated people live in a dwelling, if that is the concern. Third, Removing the words owner occupied, in my opinion, removes a discrimination. And this discrimination is, is against families that are renting. So you're saying with this statement or, or in the ordinance, owner occupied that families that are renting uh, cannot get more than two. So that, uh, that can be remedied by use of this different definition. And I think a fourth, fourth reason for a change the ordinance is to provide convenience to the people. Um, I live in the area myself. I have a lot of driveways that I can park on, but there are times that I park on the street, I like to park on the street. I don't want to be rushing around looking for a parking permit 
because I only have two. I'd like to have more permits. So I think a matter of convenience. I think there's going to be enough things irritating the people <laughs> besides the permit system. And uh, I'd like to decrease the irritation from the permit system. So any questions? Oh, I got one comment. When I look at this map, you know what it reminds me of? The same rules the DNR put in for trout fishing in the state. <laughs> <laughs> it's just about as confusing, and that's why everybody quit fishing for trout around here. Okay. <laughs> Rich Christensen has asked to speak on this issue, and before we forget he's here, we should, we should hear from him. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Rich Christensen, 10 South 3rd Street here in Platteville. Um, hearing a lot of talk here, and uh, what kind of confuses me is, is I thought, you know, this all started because of Roundtree Commons, and it's go, gone so much farther than that. Uh, I, I guess the biggest thing is, you know, as uh, Alderman uh, Decker was was talking about you know the sheer area and, and all the different types of streets and, and colors and, and things like that and and I really wonder if it's all all necessary uh, why we have such a large area that that we think is going to be affected by Roundtree Commons you know if the university is doing its part you know they've assured us they've got all these parking spaces lined up and if they're doing their part I don't think it's going to be as bad as everybody thinks you know, they think it's going to be just a giant port of locusts, uh, the students and their cars all over this part of the city. And, and I think if things are done right, you know, we wouldn't have to go half the distance away from Roundtree Commons as, as what we've done. Um, and I don't think it's, I don't think we're, we'd have to ask a lot of the university, maybe, you know, this has been talked about, I don't know. You know, my first inkling that I was going to be affected, you know, that this was coming all the way up to Pine Street was when I saw, you know, posts in the ground. Uh, the signs weren't put on until June 1st, but I saw the posts in the ground, you know, a few days before that uh, in late May and then June 1st, you know, it started and it was a surprise to me that it was coming that far away from Roundtree Commons. And uh, I think what the university needs to do is, you know, tell those students who are living in, in Roundtree Commons in no uncertain terms where they should park and where they should not park. And then they should go one step further, you know, to come up with some type of action that they'll take when students park where they're not supposed to park. And of course, the city will be involved in that with the police, you know, identifying cars that belong to Roundtree Common students that are parking in areas they should not park in. So, you know, all these problems about, you know, the extra permits and, you know, two hours and four hours and 15 minutes and all that stuff, you know, half of it could be eliminated if we thought that it's not going to affect such a large area. I suspect and if, right. it, if it ends up affecting such a large area, I think we could quickly expand it in a couple of weeks, probably. Now, you know, we might be too far along in this process. All the signs have been purchased and put up and, and, and all these plans have been made, but I just think it, it's gone way too far and it's, and, and all these other things that have nothing to do with Roundtree Commons. You know, Bailey and, and Roundtree, you know, those are residents living in the area that basically want to privatize their streets, you know, and even streets they don't live or park on when you're talking about people parking behind uh, McGregor Plaza, that whole area there. So all these, all these things that have nothing to do with Roundtree Commons have been brought into this, and there's got to be a simpler way. Just as a, a point of, kind of, I agree with you. I think that people are going to find out this isn't going to be quite as big a problem as they feared. And hopefully that'll be the case. But the plan as it was developed was done out of neighborhood meetings. And <coughs> you can imagine people wanting to ensure that they don't have problems or probably if they maybe go a little further than they needed to. But if they had the assurance that we could quickly expand it when we find out there is a problem, um, yeah. I would hope would that, would, that would be enough. <laughs> That's probably true. 
Well, I, I look at it as a, there are two things going on here. One is Roundtree Commons, and the RDA now is starting to look at downtown parking. And we, we discussed that when the, with the Bonson Street, pro, Bonson Street project. So now we're working on that. They're working on that. So that's why you're involved in this. And it's, to me, it's not really uh, Roundtree Commons, but it's spilled up into that area now because people from Division Street wanted to be included in Roundtree Commons, and then it just went across. Well, I, I'm afraid some of those people are, are using it as an opportunity to privatize their streets. You know, it, it's well, I don't particularly like the word privatize because they want to be able to use their street. Sometimes, I mean, is I'm going by Bailey, and I, Bailey during the year is usually filled up. And so the people that live there, they want to be able to use their street. Well, well the other thing with this whole thing, and probably why you haven't heard even more, is that, you know, probably 80 or 90 percent of the people in this whole area do have garages and driveways. They haven't really thought about, you know, relatives coming and visiting and parking on the street, and, and really they should be getting these $50 fines you know, if they're there for more than two hours in a lot of places. So, you know, there could be a lot of people in this area that don't realize what a headache it might be to call into the police station and report the make and model and color of the car with the license plate when you have, you know, five people with cars come and visit you for Thanksgiving dinner or whatever it might be, or any time of the year. Um, and if it was just a smaller area, you know, Half the people don't have that problem then. I'm I agree guess, with you. Uh, in, in a couple months here, we'll pretty, have a pretty good idea where we're at with this. <coughs> so. where, where's the RDA at as far as uh, downtown and proposals? You're talking about paid parking, correct? Yep, we're talking about paid and parking. You, you haven't decided uh, precisely where this paid parking is going to be. Um, uh, we, we will have be, possibilities. That That's will be, uh, that is our August agenda. And can you, uh, can you find enough paid parking to meet the needs of downtown tenants and employees? Well, now that is a question because, it, I mean, we know how many apartments, but we really don't know how many tenants are downtown. I don't know how many people live in each apartment. Thank you. Just uh, one more thing, you know, I, I, I like uh, Mr. Killian's idea for, you know, lease spaces at, at some point and the landscaping and things like that and make improvements all over, but these things don't happen overnight. Whereas, you know, eliminating that area for downtown residents did happen overnight. So, you know, I've always estimated that about 50 downtown residents park on Roundtree and Bailey in, in that general area, you know, if, wherever they can find a spot to, to make up the shortest walking distance to their apartment. But, you know, when it happens overnight to them, you know, where are they going to go? And that's why I, I'm a little concerned that this is happening overnight without, you know, lease spots or any other spots available for these people to go. So I, I think you got to hold off on eliminating that parking until you have options available. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get it fixed. <laughs> sure. my, my question is the rest of we're making it worse. The rest of Roundtree. Uh, what's the rest of Roundtree? Uh, Roundtree Mitchell to Alden is um, both side parking. So that's going to be alternate alternate side parking in the winter, they'll yeah. move from side to side, correct? To and I then so, I round tree from Alden to the end of round tree is, is one side parking, so no parking. that'll stay like yeah. that. Right, um, yeah, from Alden to the south end, it's, uh, there's no parking on the west side, so right. that and would remain. What I'm saying in this proposal, what I'm recommending is that between Mitchell and Pine, that that not be alternate side parking. That's obvious that couldn't be that because if you have paid parking, you wouldn't have want people moving in except in the case of emergency. Okay. I mean, I think we also heard another 
uh, Alderman Dawes say say that she was in favor of eliminating that block from this consideration, which sounds an awful lot like what it's what you were saying. Same thing saying as, correct. I think as what we're both saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay. I've gotten a lot of feedback, but it's all from individuals. Is there a way you guys could make some kind of a motion or a general consensus for me <laughs> to make changes or? or I don't no. think we're at a motion. I, I support leaving Sunset as a parking permit, and I uh, have said that it would be my opinion that we should remove um, those two blocks from this parking uh, ordinance. I mean, there are other things that will need to be applied, but in terms of this particular ordinance, I think it should be removed. And uh, I, um, I do have a question about, uh, one, at one point in time, we had a letter from Quick Trip about uh, their employee parking it's on- It's been resolved. Has that been resolved? Yeah, I checked into that and they said they okay. were happy with the res resolution, so. Okay. When you say parking on Sunset, are you referring to the orange two hour parking with permit only, or the red permit only? I think they they wanted permit parking. I think. Okay. I, what was it? Eight. Was that I a mean, motion? I think you did the survey. <laughs> it was eight. It was, four. Four. it was it was permit parking is what they wanted, so right. as to limit the. Okay. 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 So. Are we agreed on the perpendicular parking? That's what it is now. Well, yes. That. But okay. the first thing, Ken, is to take it out of this ordinance. Then we'll have yes. to come back That's with what I'm another saying. one. Right. That's from Mitchell to Pine. But it's not all perpendicular from Mitchell to Pine, only a portion of it. Just all, all that whole street, so Mitchell to Pine. Everybody agrees with that? I mean, there's a lot of you that haven't said anything. I don't want to. The perpendicular is not going to be enlarged. Is that correct? It can't be. The what? The perpendicular will not be enlarged toward Pine because you don't have the. I physical. have not heard anybody suggest changing the size of the parking yeah. lot. Okay. Okay. Then my next. Uh, <laughs> This big calm, Get, let, let's, yeah. let's try to wind yeah, this up here. Up. <laughs> Come on. We, I mean, this is like. I'd like to see the correct signage by Harrison Park and Sherman Park, which is four hour parking, 6 a.m. to 1030. The parks close at 1030. So does the city council want Mr. Killian's proposal or the proposal that your city staff submitted in the packet, making it four hours plain and simple? I need some direction as to what you want in the ordinance for next meeting. <clears throat> Well, the reason I say 1030 is because I don't like, well, I've lived there since 68. I don't like to see loitering over at the park. Ken, we're not trying to solve that problem. That's right. We're trying to we deal with the parking We can't handle issues. every little thing you don't like. But at least, Come on. At least say until 1030 at night. Why well, you don't need. Well, if you, you don't run don't across the street right and now, tell them to get out of here. <laughs> just calm down. <laughs> right now it says 10 p.m. Well, four days a week or five days a week. And, and so that sign now is saying you can't use the park after 6 p.m. and you can't use the park on weekends. So the sign is wrong. Then I think you should discuss that with city staff and they'll correct it. Okay. If it is incorrect, then they will correct it because it's just a mistake. And I don't think we need to change an ordinance to correct a mistake. Well, well, we have no need to change do. the signs because the permit the, the ordinance is changing it all to four hours. Four hours, but. So why would we change the sign only to change it after you adopt the ordinance? I mean. <laughs> but it's four hours around the clock is what you're saying. Yes, that is what the ordinance says. And until yeah. I hear otherwise from the city council, and I don't know to make that change. <laughs> and then the signage at Valley View is also No, incorrect. that's that. Okay, we're moving on. Okay, I, I, I just I have, Mr. I, Mr. I have, President, I do have one more question. I would like an estimate of the expense that has been associated with Don't the, the signs. I, not tonight, but I would like it in staff notes next time. The expense that has been, uh, how much has been expended on signs in this area and also the uh, staff time to put the signs in. I'd like to know the cost of this project. I'd be happy to get that for you, your staff note. Uh, before we adjourn this topic, could I go over a brief review of what I have in my notes for changes for next meeting? No. Okay. No, All right. Take from Pine to Mitchell on Bailey and Roundtree and take them out of the plan. Take Sunset Drive permit parking only in red. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, I would still like to add two permits for landlords if people are agreeable to that. Two permits versus one. Fine. Sir. So I'll get Fine. two. Yeah, they get two, Fine. and then the ordinance, I think, said one. <laughs> two. Fine. Or we could go back to let everybody park wherever they want. Maybe there that would go. solve the problem. <laughs> it might. All this discussion. Sorry, well, it's just in a just moment of lucidity that I offered that up. So two permits for a landlord. Why can't we, if somebody a landlord comes in and asks for an extra permit, why don't we just give them one? Yeah. It's got yeah. Anybody can come you know, in for what? a day permit anytime. Yeah. Moving on to item C under information and discussion, we have a resolution authorizing submission of a community development block good block grant application, specifically the multi-use library block redevelopment project and a public hearing scheduled for August 14th. Talk about this. Any comments on that? Uh, sure, I can do a brief uh, staff report. Um, the City Council uh, approved at the Library Board's request a contract with uh, Economic Development Partners, a company uh, owned by Cindy Yagi, and they are issuing a grant application to the WEDC or the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation on behalf of the library in the City of Platteville to apply for a planning grant to determine what to do with the library block and what kind of development could occur on that site into and including a possible library. Um, the multi-use library block redevelopment project is a application that we will see at a public hearing on August 14th. And um, once the public hearing occurs, uh, it's anticipated that we will get that application out to CDBG for funding. Uh, the request will be for about $25,000 to match the library's $25,000 for a $50,000 study, approximately. So we're doing everything we can to get the word out to the public that this is something that we're going to be applying for. Oh, Larry, the resolution says after seeking public input, uh, the Common Council has recommended that an application be submitted to the state of Wisconsin. Yes. Um, so you're going to seek public input by having the um, public, the public hearing, hearing on August 14th. Yep. Mm. And then you'll be asked to consider approving the resolution. This process is laid out on a public participation plan that the City Council adopted four or five years ago. Any other questions, comments on that? Item D is a property order notification policy for rental inspections. Uh, I only had one suggestion. You had, um, I believe it was Rick Reniker's phone number down on the postcard. Maybe you could add a email address. That might be convenient, more convenient for people. On the postcard? It, yeah, it, it is. It is on there. It gives a it phone number, 778. There should be an email address on there, as well as the office Oh, number. it is there. Okay, yep. sorry, I didn't see it. <coughs> 778. But, it just, but the, the, um, the actual wording says contact him at that phone number. It doesn't say anything about emailing. But that the rental inspector, the 778-7609 number is not a city number, is this correct? That's correct. MV. Well, it's a That's cell MV number. services. Yep. Oh, it's what? I thought it was a cell number. It it's a cell a, number for, of, of the, of the for the inspection a contractor service. who does the inspections, the rental inspections. Tell me again who requested this besides the city council. <laughs> the rental inspector didn't request this, did he? No. No, I didn't and, think so because he told me we didn't need it. We would have done the policy, but I think someone wanted to see the policy too. We already approved the ordinance, and that's all done. So what's this going to? So we're gonna, we going to have some? We're going to have staff now spend time going through the records, making sure that every that one third of the rental units that we send out a post closed card to say approximately one third of all our rental units every year we're going to spend time sending out a postcard maybe two postcards on each on these units in instead of being after the license expires we're trying to move the program to notifying them well in advance that they have to have their license or they'll be penalized for not having a license yeah i guess i was wondering like how many of our uh, license holders uh 
never get around to getting it done on a timely manner within, say, two weeks or something. I mean, is this really a big problem? Is it a problem with 100 units or, well, or we've 500? Had the, we've probably had a few discussions on this. I, I don't remember all of the details, but I can, I can find that out for you. I mean, this was a process that we put in motion probably four or five months ago that this is the direction you wanted to go. Yeah. Is that a work session? Well, as it stands now, the city supplies the database to MV Consulting. So if the city gets involved in sending postcards, that's going to take staff time. It's going to cost 32 cents per postcard uh, to send this out. And what I find bothersome about it is it's going to be cumbersome because we're going to send out the postcard and then the inspector, they're going to have to call the inspector, MV Consulting, and then the MV Consulting is going to have to tell the city, well, so-and-so did not uh, respond by 45 days or whatever, and send them another postcard when, to me, MV Consulting ought to be doing the sending. And also, at 45 days, uh, you know, that's a month and a half, and uh, it seems to me they ought to be able to come up with an inspection date within a month and a half. So my recommendation is that uh, when the second notice goes out, that they be informed that uh, administrative and late fees may be assessed. And the reason I put in the words administrative and is that uh, when you send out a certified letter, it costs about 6 to $7. It requires about $15 worth of staff time, roughly $21 to send out a certified letter. So what I'm proposing, recommending, is that administrative fee of $25 be charged every time we send a certified letter out to get somebody to comply. We should not be doing this free. If the council wants to make changes to this, we certainly can. The reason you have this before you is because this is the direction you asked us to go. Well, I was under the impression, uh, Larry, that we were just going to send out one postcard. I mean, can't can't uh, people be responsible for their own properties? And when they get a postcard, a great they question. should do something about it. The DMV doesn't send me two postcards to say that my driver's license is going to expire or my car registration is going to expire i get one right and so i think at the time the council wanted to make sure that there was enough notice provided well 90 days is a lot well yeah. <laughs> we're happy to make whatever changes you want i it's, i believe that this well, is exactly what, what you had requested and if you want to change it that's fine what happens now how does that rental inspector know to call me up and say you gotta you gotta get your place inspected that's what he does. Yeah, me too. He has the database. They look at the database. Oh, he just calls me up and says, and I said, okay, I'll meet you next week. My, not everyone lives in town. Either. My And my understanding from our discussion and work session was that while you may call back, there are a lot of people who don't. And then we have the issue of no rental license. And then we have the issue of MV services repeatedly calling people. And all of a sudden, it's MV's problem that you don't have a license. And I thought that in this discussion, we talked about returning the responsibility for the rental license to the person who owns the rental property. Hence, like your driver's license or like your car license, you get a postcard that says your license is expiring. It's up to you to go to the DMV and get your license or pay the fee. It's not up to the DMV to come to you. And so I fully support yeah. moving this direction. I d and I don't like option one, where after two postcards, the city's going to make calls to people. Yeah. I mean, I thought that this was, and, and you know, Patrice, I could support one postcard. That's what I get for my driver's license. That's what I get for my car license. But how many, pro how many, how many units do we have that are past due on their licensing, approximately. 
Let's say we got 2,000 rental properties. I don't know if that number's units or something. Maybe we got 2,000 or 2,500. How many of them are passed through at any one point in time? At least 22. <laughs> Columba. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's 21. <laughs> yeah, well, those we know of. Well, we know that card's not going to do any good. <laughs> I, I think this was this was to put the onus on you to make the schedule, not for MV to call you and say, when can you do this, and now I can't do it now, and then call me back that. in three or four days and yeah but is it really a problem i don't know it well, was staff <laughs> said it was a problem how big a problem is it why create if we don't even know it's a big problem well we did discuss this during a work session like yeah, larry well, said several I months think. ago and i do remember councillor doss suggesting the postcard idea which i was in full agreement with but not three or four postcards you know just one is good I thought it was a bad idea then, Barb. <laughs> Still do. So. Well, so, as usual. You know, maybe that's because you're a property owner and you like being called have, instead I, of having to initiate that well, call. Somebody, no, it's because when somebody you, calls me, I come uh, running. All right, all right. Ken, Ken would like to add something here. To me, the problem is there are no teeth. <laughs> There's no what? There are no teeth. They have five months to do nothing. Well, but then if they don't have the license, you cite them. It's easy. There's plenty yeah, of teeth there. Yeah, but it takes there. five months to get to that point. Cite them. Why does it take seven you know, Here you, you give them 90 days to, to expiration, they do nothing, and then you give them two more months. No, I would just cite them. Cite them? You don't cite you need cite to start something I mean, I, when, when I get the notice, I get the place inspected. I mean, it's not that hard. Well, that's a, that's if they're out-of-town landlord, then they're going to have to make arrangements. Right. And, and it's then not our fault they're out-of-town landlords. Yeah. Right. And then, there's, then there are people, landlords, that once they get the information from the city that the license has been approved, they don't make the payment on time. That's item. We don't have that in. in we should put something in this item. We don't have that in here. Well, if we're going to do this, I'd go with one postcard. That's it, period. Yeah, I agree. Fine. Yeah. Okay, we've decided. <laughs> one are we, right, are so we done we'll, with this? We'll, we'll make change changes for next time. One postcard, and then tickets are issued the day your license expires, or the day after. If you haven't made an appointment. Yeah, okay. If you, well, I mean, if, you've if made you haven't made a reasonable <laughs> attempt, yeah. I would like to see and a fee if we send a certified letter. Well, there's no yeah. certified letter. No, it's one postcard. No, a certified, letter. Like a certified letter. Uh, why would we send yeah. a certified letter? We send them a postcard. They don't get inspected in time. They get cited. Yeah, right. Couldn't be simpler. One yeah. postcard. Keep it simple. They have a deadline to get a postcard. They, they know if they're in business that this is the regulation in town here, and if they don't know what the timelines are, then they need to do business better. I don't think we need to babysit landlords to make sure that they do everything on time. Do it when you're supposed to. Dick, do you have to get babysat in order to do this stuff? Oh, I don't know. Is that a trick question? I don't know. That's a trick question. <laughs> I mean, this is like, come on, what? <laughs> Let's, let's treat people like adults and expect them to actually do what they're supposed to do. You're going to take out the certified letter one. I wouldn't do that if it were me. That's on our license. I mean, I just like, That's come on. I mean, if you're in business, you do what you're supposed to do to be in business. And yeah. if you can't pay attention to what the licensing requirements are, maybe you ought not be, be a landlord. Be responsible. Be, no, be responsible, heaven forbid. Okay. I guess you're going to take it out. I haven't heard anybody opposed to that idea. So as I understand it, we're taking it out. It will be back in your council packet for approval next meeting. Why well, I can't wait to do item E here. Uh-oh, what's E? It's regarding the municipal citations for rental code violations. Yeah. Well, this is you need to go to the restroom, everybody. Go right now because you've got a half hour coming with this one. Clean up, right? Yeah. <laughs> this isn't that bad. Th this oh, you already agreed to. Neither was D. <laughs> D was a postcard. It took us 20 minutes. <laughs> But now it's only one. Now we're on E, Ordinance Amending Chapter 1 regarding municipal citations for rental code violations. This guy's Ken? Already, already voted on, actually, so when it's you modify Chapter 3. pretty straightforward, so I have no comment. We already oh, voted. quick. Oh. Anybody else? Oh. <laughs> Item F, Ordinance Creating Section 3.46, Community Safe Routes Committee. Yes, we found that the committee was approved by motion. All this does is it takes the committee and makes it a formal ordinance. The Safe Routes Committee already exists. It, this just documents it as a formal ordinance. All right. This has been recommended by the Safe Routes Committee as well. And I believe the Park Commission. The Park Committee? 
No. Okay, Park just safe routes. Item G tonight is a conditional use permit for outside dining at 300 West Business Highway 151. This is the Las Palmas Mexican Restaurant. This has gone through the Plan Commission and been approved with some requests for information regarding the, uh, the specific structural characteristics of the deck that they want to put on up there. They're going to put a, uh, a deck that comes off the top story so that people can dine outside. 83. 62 feet long. It, it is a big deck. I uh, did have a question about that. Go ahead. I asked the engineer, and, and uh, the reason that my question comes up is because I have a deck. We have a deck similar to this, and I'm wondering about the, the uh, stability, because I can't tell what these posts are, how these posts are anchored. So I asked the engineer that question so I'd like to have that answer for next time. Because what I'm thinking about is that if you have a number of people standing by the railing, uh, the possibility of this thing swaying out. So how is this thing anchored? I could not find any bracing uh, shown here. And uh, it's sort of like a ship uh, where you stand on all one side and it capsizes because you're on one side. Same thing with a deck. If you're on one side of the deck, you put a lot of weight on that particular side and it could be unstable. So I asked that of the engineer. I'd like to have an According to the diagram, there look like pretty substantial footings in to which there is some kind of bolt and then they're attached yeah. to a bolt. That's what the diagram says. But it's, it's not a post in the ground. Nope. Yep. Three of them. That's a, that's a different situation if you have a post in the ground versus just, with, with just a bolt. Any other questions about that? Item H is a conditional use permit for storage units at 500 North Water. This also has gone through the Plan Commission for approval. This is to take down the two uh, buildings that are across from the armory. Uh, one's a house, the other was a, at one point, some kind of commercial storefront property, and there's a little roof that goes between them. And the proposal is to take those down and, and replace it with a combination uh, apartment building with some storage units below. Um. There's going to be one um, apartment, right? Yes. Up above it. Is it going to be the owner? Do you know uh, Joe living in it, or is he going to rent it out? It'll be a rental. Rental. And there was, uh, the neighbors were notified of this? Yep. Yes. They were for it. <gasps> yes, they were. Can't help but be an improvement. It's an improvement. <laughs> looks a lot better. Kind of an That was their story. thing. And the storage units, um, are they going to be visible from Water Street? Um, be facing north and south, so as you're driving up Water Street, you will be able to see the doors. Oh, so they won't be facing Water Street? Correct. No, no there'll be five doors on the north side of the property, and we've asked for them to put screening there, uh, plantings to screen them, and then some on the south side. Okay. It probably doesn't show up in your computer as well as it does on paper. But Any other questions on that? Item I is an amended initial resolution relating to industrial development revenue bond financing on behalf of UW Platteville Real Estate Foundation Incorporated. And I don't know, is this a staff thing or Fred? Do we have Fred do it or what's the? It's a request from C.B. Smith, okay. uh, Representative uh, Fred Rickers. If Fred, if you like would come forward and tell us what you have on your mind here, please. Patiently waited Mark. through the meeting and I can see it. Good evening to you all. My name is Fred Rickers, 419 Venture Court, Verona, Wisconsin. Um, as I talked to you last September, we'd be back this summer to get ready to complete the financing for the Roundtree project. Um, we, you may recall in September you approved, as the RDA approved, a $25 million resolution, which we're asking to increase to $26 million. Mm -hmm. You, 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 will, you will recall that the resolution is quite clear, and if you read the document, it again restates that this is, does not in any way constitute an obligation to the city, has no effect on your financing, your borrowing base, or your creditability whatsoever. It's simply a system under the Internal Revenue Code and Wisconsin statutes, which whereby with this resolution, we can get a bond whereby the investor in the bond gets some tax exemptions on the interest that's paid. The reason we're here asking to increase the amount is quite simple. 
we, uh, Morgan Stanley will be assisting us in the financing of this transaction with some of their investors, and they've asked us to set aside a debt reserve of an amount of $2 million. So this money will be put literally into probably a bank here and be held uh, during the term of these bonds for about 10 years and then distributed back to the investors just to ensure that there's no risk to the investors or to anybody else in this project whatsoever. It's simply an additional debt reserve to make sure all the payments are made. It's interesting to note, uh, as I was discussing this with the folks in New York, I said, gee whiz, we're oversubscribed. You know, the project is, is, is as you probably have heard, uh, and you've discussed this evening, the student body count here at, at, uh, at uh, Platteville is increasing rapidly. I spoke with Chancellor uh, Shields just day before yesterday, no, yesterday, and, and the enrollment is, is just skyrocketing, which speaks, I think, very well to the university and the community. And, uh, and this, this project uh, was filled and committed for in February. So we're quite excited. And, and the other thing that I told you earlier, although it's not a concern of the city, is we're keeping the rents in this new building approximately the same as the rents in the other facilities so that all the kids, not just the rich kids, can, can, can enjoy it. So we would hope that the, uh, the additional million dollar uh, authorization would be allowed. And again, it's only for a debt reserve that will be created for the project. What is the rent um, per room then, Fred, do you know? Uh, wh who asked that? You, I'm sorry, Did I didn't see. Um, the rent is, on a semester basis, it's, it's approximately, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be close here, it's approximately $2,500 per semester, if I recall. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dwayne, is there any r reason that the city couldn't hold the extra $2 million and get the interest off that? Oh, I don't control that. That would that be great? <laughs> I, that'll be done by Morgan Stanley. And what I'm, we're trying to do now is with the with Wisconsin folks, we're trying to make sure it's it's in Wisconsin. And logically, it would be held here in Platteville. So oh, I'm saying, but it should be held by the city. Well, and I, we could realize some of the. Uh, after all, although we have to, the, other the, people are realizing. There's kind of a fun word in my business called arbitrage, and we have to ensure the appropriate arbitrage. We have to earn money on that fund so that in fact it's fair to the investors otherwise the internal revenue service and other people get very very upset with us so barb we just can't put it in your in your in your uh, i just thought it'd be a good idea yeah petty cash fund i do i mean we could hold it in reserve and earn a little interest and give you a little so we would ask approval of this amendment amendment which is identical to the one you saw previously other than it allows us to fund the project to a total of 26 rather than 25 million dollars and the only reason these bonds are available is because the city qualifies for uh, special circumstances because of flood recovery. Actually, the RDA is the, is the issuer here. That's correct. The RDA actually has more ability here to, uh, to under state, state statute to issue these and get a greater tax exemption for the investor in both state and federal taxes. That's correct. And we thank you for that, by the way. And this, this is a, the old, we used to call them industrial revenue bonds, IRBs. And this a type of bond is a result of the 2008 flood disaster that all of us in southern Wisconsin experienced. Boy, we could use some rain now. Uh, and these funds have to be expended by, which they will be obviously, by December 2013. So this will be one of the last projects of this nature in Wisconsin. Um, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, that ends the on camera portion of our meeting tonight, we're going to go into work session and talk about dispatch and street improvements. We'll take a five minute break before we do that. And there's the possibility at the end of the work session that the T grant, which was tabled earlier, may come off. And then we'll adjourn. Five minute break. <laughs>